Hi everybody, we are back uh, live uh, from IBTM Trade Show Barcelona and we have a great guest with us today. This is Martin Boyle from Yapco. Uh, well, uh, I remember Yapco, that was my first educational uh, actually uh, uh, my first uh, uh, actually educational um, event after I uh, was uh, I started to work as a PCO in Tsankaryo Dome. It was in Switzerland. Oh yes, uh, it was a lot of time, uh, a long time ago. Actually, in Wolfsburg, yes, exactly in Wolfsburg. Uh, are you still doing something like that uh, in the Apco, or uh, is Wolf Wolfsburg still uh, 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 there? We we changed the program a little bit. It's uh -huh. called our Edge seminars now. I Apco Edge. Um, uh, we used to be based in Wolfsburg for that seminar every January, every year. Um, that now rotates around Europe, so not just in Wolfsburg. And the content has changed a little bit. We talk a lot about, you know, the management and the organization of meetings, but we dive a lot deeper into, you know, work relationships and working with colleagues and working with clients as well. So it's a bit of the hard um, uh, skill sets and the soft skill sets coming together. Um, but we also do an EDGE seminar in Asia Pacific and Latin America now every year. So um, we probably do on average about five or six different EDGE seminars across the globe now. So we've grown a little bit since the Wolfsburg. So you're what we call a Wolfie. Yeah. You're a, a Wolfsburg Wolfie. <laughs> I'll, go to, I'll call you Wolfie from now on. Um, but th this is a lot of attention to education, a lot of attention to bringing up new staff. Um, how important is this for Yapco? It's hugely important. I mean, our mission is really to raise the professionalism and the standards of quality, uh, not just within our own community, but within the whole meetings industry. So most of our educational programs that we deliver, other than our annual meeting in General Assembly, um, is for the industry as a whole. So we have everyone from convention bureaus, convention centers, PCOs, suppliers, all attend our seminars. But we have a journey to education, we call it. And the journey starts when someone uh, becomes a new employee of one of our members or company within the uh, meetings industry. Uh, and we do an online educational program called WebEdge. Okay. So it's a Congress management course, uh, and you can earn CMP points for that. So that's your first introduction to Congress management. And then we do education at trade shows like IBTM, IMEX, etc. cetera. Um, whereas the next level, it's a little bit deeper. And then we do things like our EDGE seminars. And we do a beginner course in EDGE seminar to an advanced course in EDGE seminars. And then, of course, our annual meeting in General Assembly is for our C-suite, our owners, operators of our members. So the educationals are open to anyone or just to the members? Anyone. Our Web Edge platform is open to anyone. It's complimentary to our members as an added value of their membership. But it's very normal. I, mean, I, think, I think it's $150 for a full Congress management course online with WebEdge. And then our EDGE seminars, depending if they are where they're hosted, there's a fee to attend some of those seminars. And they're anywhere from two, two and a half days to four days, just depending on the content. Now, in this conversation, we already touched a little bit on the annual Congress and General Assembly. Yes. Which, uh, next one is taking place in Ljubljana. Can't wait. You know, so uh, having Ljubljana talks behind us, having the Ljubljana castle behind us. We are all very excited of Yapco coming to Ljubljana. Um, what is your expectation? What do you expect of Ljubljana? What do you expect to happen there? Well, so far, my expectation uh, is incredibly high um, because I visited Ljubljana last December after IBTM mm -hmm. and thoroughly impressed. Just the whole team dynamic within Ljubljana, within the city, but then also from Slovenia as well, just everyone getting together and, and really supporting our community coming to the city. Uh, the city is amazing. It's a beautiful, stunning city. Everything is so close and so easy to get to and walk from one space to the next, which is amazing for international delegates that are coming in. Uh, I think the, the cultural experience we're going to have when we're in Ljubljana is going to be really deep um, and meaningful to people. And I think when, especially our international community, we have people that are coming from Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Latin America, when they come to a destination now, they want to experience that culture and that personality that's within a city. And you certainly get that feel and that sense when you arrive. So, all right, my expectation is high. The team is great that's working with us to deliver it. Our, one of our members, Kankari Abdom, um, but the team Ljubljana coming together and working with us is, uh, is going to be fantastic. So we're really, really looking forward to it. And one of the interesting things I would say as well for this program, uh, because those that attend our annual meeting in General Assembly are the C-suite, the owners, operators of our member companies, the education that they expect is quite high level, very strategic. 
Uh, and what's really exciting for me with the lineup of speakers that Team Ljubljana have pulled together for us is it's very academic, which is very, very interesting. Mm. Coming from outside of our industry, bringing their expertise, their opinions, mm. their valued uh, education and knowledge to our community so that we can learn what's going on in their world and then apply some of their learnings to us and mm. our organizations when we go back to our offices. So it's going to be a really, really interesting mm. conversation. And then it allows our members as well then to sit around the table after each presentation and talk about what they've just heard mm -hmm. and how then they can take some of that knowledge back from a different sector. So that to me is really, really exciting, really exciting. Sustainability is really important for your Huge. association. What can you say about this? Uh, how uh, will you develop this? And what is for you a definition of sustainable event? Uh, are you talking about environmental sustainability or organizational sustainability? And about all aspects okay. of sustainability. Um, yeah. So from a an entire sustainability perspective, mm -hmm. uh, I always try and refer us back to the UN SDGs, mm -hmm. right? There's 17 goals of the United Nations. And I say, you know, if we can contribute to a number of those through any of the programs that we deliver and demonstrate that we can contribute to some of those, then we're doing well mm -hmm. as a community. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure we can, you know, sharing knowledge, imparting knowledge mm -hmm. to helping uh, others come together and, you know, partnership for the goals when we bring partners around the table as well. Um, from an environmental sustainability perspective, Ljubljana to me is amazing and the work that the mayor's office and the city has, uh, you know, taken on board. Mm -hmm. um, the walking city, you know, for me, that's amazing. The, the recycling program that the city has in place is amazing. Uh, you don't see that when you're walking the city, but you experience it, you, you, you sense it, right? Um, and for me, that's amazing. And uh, we have a main theme of our annual meeting every year is sustainability. It's sort of our red line mm -hmm. that runs through all of our content. And so making sure that um, both what we practice, mm -hmm. but then what we're discussing on the floor, uh, day in and day out when we're there, has a sustainability thread to it. And we have to think about that, you know. So we have a policy that we put in place um, for our 50th anniversary back mm -hmm. in 2018, 2019, that we... Um, have no single-use plastics at any of our events. Mm -hmm. So things like single-use plastic bottles, we don't want to see. Mm -hmm. But it's easy for us to communicate that to our members. Mm -hmm. And we also ask organizations outside of our members to sign mm -hmm. a zero plastics mm -hmm. pledge. Mm -hmm. So for that year, we had you know up to 50 uh, new companies sign and partner with us to make sure that they make sure that they're not using any single-use plastic. So these are the little things that we can do. Um, but if we take a step back and look at Ljubljana in general, I mean, it's going to be a remarkable, remarkable uh, success story, I think, for us Super. from a sustainability perspective. Will you measure the carbon footprint of the event itself? Well, we were just speaking about that earlier, and it's something that we have traditionally relied on our venues mm -hmm. to provide us with. We do have some work to do in that space, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so we're currently working on our sustainability strategy, okay. and that ties back into those UN SDG goals as well. Um, so sustainability, environmental, certainly. But then how do we then tie that into mm -hmm. some of the other goals that we have? But we would probably look to someone locally mm -hmm. to uh, maybe help us in measuring and capturing mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. carbon data so that we can then report back. And maybe it's the, the starting point mm -hmm. for this strategy as we start to build the strategy. Mm -hmm. And it might be a nice legacy for us as we come out of Ljubljana moving forward. So certainly looking to do something like that. Super, so, super. yeah. Coming back to Yapco, I know, I remember it was quite difficult to become a member, actually. You have strict rules, actually. You have assessment uh, of members and so on. Is still uh, like that or you're more liberal uh, regarding the membership? Uh, Iapco's USP yeah. is that every member proves and continually demonstrates that they deliver a very high quality standard service. That is where we differentiate ourselves from other national PCO associations or regional PCO associations. So um, will we ever deviate from that? No, because it's all about the quality seal for us. Um, how a member becomes a member, it is a challenge, um, but it's not a challenge if they are a quality PCO. Because if they're delivering quality services and they can demonstrate that, and we audit their company and we audit their events, uh, it can take a year to do that, mm -hmm. but we know that their commitment to demonstrating that quality level mm -hmm. will ensure that they continue to deliver that year on and year out. So when we do our annual quality checks with them, mm -hmm. we know that they easily have that data. They're more than happy to introduce us to their clients, to interview their clients and to audit their events, 
to make sure that that quality remains remains high and, and successful. And from our perspective, um, then a member, when a member becomes a member, they're proud to be a member of IAPCO, right? And they wear the IAPCO pin with pride because they know they've gone through that process. They know every year when they re-accredit with us um, <laughs> that it provides them with a USP as well when they're competing against other PCOs that don't have that accreditation. It puts them a step ahead when they're speaking to their clients. I think IAPCO definitely stands for a certain level of quality and standards. And I think, you know, enforcing those standards onto your members is very important and to upkeep your promise in a way. Indeed. Um, we, we are talking about PCOs being an integral part of the meetings industry mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the biggest challenges right now for PCOs? That's a great question, yeah. Um, I would probably say the biggest challenge is a lot of them through the pandemic started to diversify a little bit to become more communications focused and strategic focused. Many of the bigger PCOs were doing that. But some of the, I would call smaller traditional family run PCOs that are members of IAPCO started to do a lot of that and a lot of the the production elements of things as well. Um, so them having to uh, diversify and make sure they've got the right skill set in-house to be able to do those strategic and have those strategic conversations with their clients, I think is, is important. So skill set is lacking in our industry across the board. So getting the right talent into a PCO or into a bureau or into a center right now is something that we're working with universities to help to upskill and educate and inform the graduates that, you know, when you graduate from an events management course at university, you don't have to go and, you know, manage a Beyonce concert. You can come into this exciting world of, you know, events, meeting and professional events. So there's a, there's a piece there. So that's one struggle, I would say. The other struggle, I think, is that um, uh, associations are looking for more and more and more uh, in the way of um, giving back to their own communities when they deliver an event. And so the ability for a PCO to work with a bureau, for example, and a destination and their partners to make sure that they understand what that association's needs are, not the short term for a week in the destination, but the long term, and how then can they pull together a program that helps them accomplish that. And whatever that means is of the moreness, is it more funding? Is it more access to more knowledge in a region? Is it access to new partnerships? within a region when they're there that then can foster new developments and new R&D moving forward. These are the sorts of things that PCOs are having conversations with the bureaus, their clients and their members about now as well. So it's an interesting time for them all. It's, it's, it's a very, very interesting, you know, kind of subject you're touching upon, I think, because we, we all see that there's, you know, a lot of changes, there's new models. As you say, the relationship between PCOs and the associations are changing. Um, the convention bureau, bureau role, I think, is kind of becoming more recognized in many ways. But there's also another conversation, perhaps, which is about risk. You know, PCOs take a lot of risks upon themselves to create an event, to manage an event, to deliver an event with that more and more, you know, part uh, that the association is trying to deliver. Where do you see then the convention bureaus? coming in, stepping in, in risk sharing, you know, and what does it mean? Uh, look, I think it's a really interesting conversation to have and it's happening at all levels, right? But I think the first and foremost, um, we have to have the right people sitting around the table very early stages, right? So you need to have the PCO, you need to have the bureau, you need to have the main center and maybe the hoteliers association or whoever that may be sitting at the table even before a bureau considers approaching the client to bid or even to inquire about bidding for their Congress. Because then you you might have some knowledge that comes from all of those partners that can say, you know, well, maybe if it's a PCO, well, we had an office in a different part of the world that has worked in that space, either at the international level or the national level. So we understand what their long-term view and vision may be. And we, we know the players, we know the board members, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that would help. But I do think having the right people around the table very early stages, then to assess, okay, what's the best avenue, the best road to the conversation with that client? Is it directly from the bureau? Is it from a center? 
Is it from the PCO? Who has the best opportunity to have the relationship and facilitate that introduction? Uh, and then when you get around the table, it's okay. Complete transparency. What are you looking for? Who's going to take the risk? Who's going to develop the program? Where's the content coming from? How can we support each other? And once you understand that and you understand what the risk proposition is, um, then it's a conversation between the Bureau and the PCO maybe to sit down and say, okay, what can we do in order to make this a success for the client and for the destination and the PCO? The PCOs are commercial entities, right? You know, so uh, of course, they're a business like any other business. They have P&L. Bureaus are government, but business like any other. There's P&L you have to consider with as well. So we have to just be transparent in that and have that open dialogue. Um, there's a lot of risk models that are out there. Some are more successful than others, I would say. Uh, some PCOs take on full risk. Others, no, we are the expert consultants coming in and we charge a fee to come in and manage and we will help mitigate the risk. We will put processes in place so that you don't have to worry about the risk. But those that are there that share risk or discuss risk or are open to managing the risk, then um, I think it's just an open, transparent conversation to have. Yeah. Interesting. There is sometimes competition between so-called full-service event agencies and PCOs. What can you say about that? Who is better in doing the, the job, actually? For example, let's assume that we have a big event in front of us, uh, like, I don't know, opening of Olympics uh, in, in Paris. Who will do job better, PCO or event agency? Yeah, I know this is a provocation, but... Yeah, no, I like, I like, <laughs> I like controversial conversations. This is great. Um, look, PCO's expertise is in the delivery of academic, scientific uh, conferences, exhibitions, etc. right? Where there's an exhibition and a conference that is part of the same event. Um, where you have uh, like an opening ceremony of something like an Olympics or something that is outside of that space, some PCOs have that marketing communications expertise that they may have a team that can come in and then support or deliver on some of those events. But others don't. So knowing their expertise and where their expertise lies, I think is essential. Um, some PCOs will probably bid for if they do have that expertise in-house, some of these types of events. And it will be their, their marketing and comms side of the business that delivers, not the PCO side of the business. And um, whereas some of the PCOs will look at that RFP and think that's a great event to be involved in. It's not really where our expertise lies. So we need to be honest and take a step back. There are some great agencies out there, mm -hmm. amazing creative agencies and communications agencies that have a lot of experience delivering these types of events that are probably better suited to the grand events mm -hmm. where you might find a PCO with a, a communications arm come in and support a certain aspect of a bigger event. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think there's opportunity for most, but understanding the area of expertise and the value you can bring to the event, I think is important for them all to mm -hmm. be aware of and honest with initially. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about communication uh, services? Uh, you, you mentioned that before, so a lot of PCOs are buying some PR companies and so on. Uh, what is happening behind the scenes? So why, why is this important to, to PCOs? And uh, what kind of business model is developing out of, it, of, of this actually? I think one of the positive things of the pandemic, if there was anything, uh, one of the positive things of the pandemic was that um, associations relied a lot on their PCOs in delivery of their events. When the event wasn't happening in person and it went online digital, the associations were relying then on the PCOs to be able to help them continue their education and their communication. So as I said, you know, there are a lot of the, those PCOs that were traditional project PCOs delivering the event then transitioned into this new space. When we come out of the pandemic, now they've got that skill set in house, we're still doing the in-person, we're doing some online communications community building, establishing, um, but it's happening long term now. It's happening long after the event comes and leaves a, a destination. Um, so the associations realized, I think, maybe subconsciously at the time, um, that there's real value in working with organizations that can help them do that. So some PCOs and some communications companies collaborated initially. Some there was acquisitions, some there were mergers, um, those that were successful in merging or acquiring one over the other 
we're able then to continue working with those associations and help the associations grow. And as we know, some associations change their PCO every year. They like to work with a local PCO in market when they go into the market. Others work with a core PCO where they have the same partnership with the same team delivering their event, whichever destination it goes to. What we're finding, even with that scenario with a core PCO, is our members, if they're core, they're still reaching out to our members in market if they don't have an office, whether it's a communications office or a PCO office in a different part of the world, but they know that there's an IAPCO member in that city or in that country, they can tap into that knowledge and work and collaborate together. So for the association client, it's a bit of win-win. They've got the PCO, they've got the association, and they've got the local knowledge and expertise there as well. Do you see a trend in the core PCO business model for associations or not? A, a trend in growing yeah. more? Um, yeah, I think it depends on the association, right? Um, you know, a lot of associations have a, a strict board governance policy where a board member can only be a board member for two years or three years, whatever that might be, that term. And if that term lapses and a new board comes in, uh, the new board may want fresh thinking, fresh ideas. Uh, the core PCO model is based on understanding the needs of the association. Uh, and if you understand the needs of the association, not just from the event perspective, but the association management perspective, because that's what's happening. Once a core PCO starts working on the event, they build relationships with that community member. And that community member then is going to be with them through the event, but also I then want you to communicate with me on behalf of the association moving forward. So I know the communications tied in with our event strategy, our legacy strategy, our you know sustainability, etc. So having the same group of people building the relationship with the community is essential for some. Um, primarily, I think for the larger associations, I would say, um, because they have, I guess, the capability, the resource to be able to invest in that core competency from an outsourcing perspective. The smaller associations that travel the globe doing some amazing work, some amazing knowledge and expertise that travels with that association and that body in their, in their space and their sector, um, sometimes they still have the perception that the direct one-to-one -one communication with the local PCO, and sometimes because the national association has the relationship with the local PCO. And so depending on their board governance structure, the national is the one that has a relationship delivering the national meeting. When the international comes to town, the international says, yes, absolutely. If you have the relationship with the local, go with it. No size fits them all, right? Everything's different. Um, I have one more question. Sure. We've seen that ICA has gone and opened itself up a lot to associations in mm. the recent couple of years. Mm. Um, they're trying to be more proactive, bring them on board, talk to them. Is Yapco doing the same? Are you talking direct to associations or you leave that to your members and then they talk to the associations? Um, we, we advocate to associations on behalf of our members. We think it's really important that uh, the associations know the value that an IAPCO PCO can bring to their organization. So we do. Um, it's probably a little bit more subtle than having them part of our community, per se. Um, unlike ICA that you know, has that whole association stream as part of their, or their sector, as part of their, their, um, their community, we, we do find that associations come to the likes of our EDGE seminars. We do find associations want to engage with us more and more, which is amazing. We're finding some associations actually contributing some content to so some, some of our publications and some of that knowledge exchange. And when we do uh, speaking engagements, when we're invited at the likes of IBTM or IMEX or whatever that might be to do a panel discussion or a lecture, more times than not, we always want to have an association on stage with us because we feel it's really, really important that you hear the PCO's voice, the association's voice, and then maybe even the bureau's voice so that you're hearing it from across the space instead of just IAPCO. Um, do we have in our view of opening up membership to IAPCO for associations, it's probably not something that in the short term we're considering. And um, again, just because we come back to our value proposition, our USP is our quality PCO members. Mm. Uh, and they're the ones that have the relationship with the associations, not us as an association ourselves. My last question is uh, yes. your comment on the old slogan of MPI, when we meet, we change the world. 
what does it mean to you personally this slogan is still relevant or is it yeah it's ma it's hugely right i'm going to tell you a story yeah um i volunteer on a number of different organizations and one of which i'm involved in thank you to my wife is a, a school in africa uh -huh. okay in kenya and so i was invited to help them coordinate a um a school's sort of um <clears throat> career day uh so there was eight schools that took part in this uh, there was about a thousand students that were there of all ages from about 12 to 18 19 years old mm -hmm. and we had some amazing people on stage um you know the the owner of stagecoach plc which is a big tour, uh, transportation company we had someone from the ministry and uh, of education we had some amazing keynote speakers and i was sort of moderating it we then opened the question to all the kids in the audience what what do you want to ask any of us? And some of the questions were amazing. And one in particular was, you know, in our, in our sphere, in our society, in our culture, my parents only think I'll be successful if I'm a doctor, if I'm a lawyer, or if I'm an accountant. You're all successful. And Martin, you are involved in the meetings and events industry. You're successful. How can I convince my parents that I too can be successful in your industry? So for me, that was an amazing conversation, an amazing question for a young child to ask from Kenya, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they all felt the same thing. So leaving that gave me a sense of optimism and enthusiasm for the next generation of people coming through from all over the world to think, you know what? We have a real opportunity to help kids develop, to grow into really, truly professional individuals in our industry, regardless of where they live. And what I said to them as well was, you may be based in Kenya, but think of technology. And I showed them some examples of what we did during the pandemic. You can be in Kenya and you can be communicating with someone in Singapore, delivering an event with someone in Singapore just as easily and be professional as a lawyer, a doctor or an accountant. So for them, it gave them pride to be able to go back to their parents. And I got some beautiful emails from their parents afterwards, thanking us for being there and thanking for us to give them an option as opposed to if they're not going to be a lawyer or an accountant, they can still do something successful. So, yes. We wouldn't have had that opportunity if we weren't meeting there in person and have that one-on-one -on -one, face to face. And we all hugged afterwards as well. There so was a spark in your eyes. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Really great. good. Uh, last question is yes. always a fire question. Uh, sea or mountains? Ah. To live or work? To live, work, ah. organize events, whatever. I love the sea. There's okay. something about water for me. It's just so calming and inspirational. Super. So the sea for me, top. And the, really the last one is, have you heard about Conventa? Of course I have. Of course you have. Okay. Yes. What Absolutely. do you know about it? Um, well, not enough. Not enough. <laughs> not enough. But I'm sure the conversation is going to continue. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks a lot for being <laughs> it's our been a guest. Pleasure. Stay Thank tuned. Uh, we are coming back soon. Thank you. Thank you.